guess what? The Cambridge Science Festival is happening this week. I know! Now in preparation for one of the events taking place on April 29th, I had the privilege of interviewing MIT professor David Kaiser on his new book, How the Hippies Saved Physics. Yeah, quite a title. I wanted to know how also. Professor Kaiser is a German Schausen professor of the history of science, the head of MIT's Department of Science, Technology, and Society, and a senior lecturer in physics. <laughs> Professor Kaiser has been published in Nature, Science, Scientific American, he has been on NPR, NOVA, and has received numerous awards for his work on the history of science. And today, for the first time in history, he will be on Physics Woman. Now Professor Kaiser's new book is as awesome as its title and cover photo, which I'm told is unfortunately not him. The book is about a bunch of hippies who gathered in the 1970s at Berkeley to discuss quantum mechanics, that mysterious field of physics whose equations were pretty much set by the early 20th century. But these hippies wanted to understand what the equations meant. They wanted to understand Schrodinger's cat and Bell's theorem, among other bizarre quantum predictions. And at the same time, they were of course hippies. To quote Professor Kaiser's website, they studied quantum theory alongside Eastern mysticism and psychic mind reading, discussing the latest developments while lounging in hot tubs. Hot tub hippie highbrows, if you will. At the Cambridge Science Festival event, Professor Kaiser will be discussing this era of physics in the 1970s and answering any questions you might have. Now I am honored to present an interview with Professor David Kaiser answering a few of my questions. That's right. I mean, so theoretical physics was actually very, very strong at the time, but mm -hmm. there were kind of trends or ways of working with something like quantum theory that had become very routine, mm -hmm. and other ways that had once been dominant but had been kind of overshadowed for decades, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that these folks and others, not just them, of course, I try to capture some of the other people in the book as mm -hmm. well, that there was a, a sense in the 1970s and really building steam into the 1980s and beyond that there was... Um, there were questions that had never been resolved about the what does it all mean stuff, the big kind of late night, you know, dorm room type discussion. Mm -hmm. What's going on mm -hmm. with Schrodinger's cap or all these <laughs> long lists of kind of weird counterintuitive features of quantum theory uh, and increasingly newer topics like Bell's theorem or entanglement. Weird, I mean, really uh, hard to wrap one's head around. Kind of. Um, so the, the, the uh, when I wear my historian's cap, one of the things that really interested me was what was it like to try to make a life in physics, make a career uh, at a time of really very um, dramatic upheaval um, mm -hmm. for the profession and, and for the country more broadly. So it was a kind of large in life moment in U.S. history and the history of science, um, uh, just in the aftermath, just the kind of wake of the, um, again, very kind of colorful and, and huge dramatic uh, turmoil of the 1960s mm -hmm. uh, into the new, the new 1970s, which had, you know, kind of lots of different political and cultural and sort of intellectual um, threads coming together. Uh, so I was curious, what did, it, what did it mean to kind of grow up in the field in that time? Mm -hmm. We know a lot about what it meant to grow up in the field during World War II or during the kind of Sputnik era, Cold War priorities and big classrooms and huge budgets. Um, but what was it like when, when the sort of fortunes for the profession had reversed very, very quickly? So it was like to grow up in the field in the early mid-70s when jobs were very, very scarce, funding was falling like a stone, um, what ideas seemed relevant or interesting were kind of shifting in, in kind of curious ways. So it was, a, it was a window onto a world that was in transition, and that was really very uh, captivating for me. You know, it's fun to do uh, recent history in general. All the pe almost all the people I was writing about are still alive, or nearly all of them, and they were incredibly helpful and generous with, you know, talking with me, and I'd have all these kind of follow-up questions and sharing uh, their old letters and notes from 40 years ago with me, they still had, often just in their private collection. Photos, there really are, I must say, some great photos in the book that many people sort of <laughs> loaned yes. to me, very kindly shared with me. So so it's fun to be able to um, to sort of interact with people and ask them very directly, you know, what was it like, what were you thinking, what were you doing, and to sort of use that to help triangulate to things that really were written down on the page, you know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, and really try to, it, it felt almost like a detective story when trying to, they follow the kind of story and some of the main the main people um, through increasingly kind of to me at least surprising places. Oh, that's, yeah. that's another thing that really drew me to the particular people I wanted focusing on uh, is that I mean I think to a person they had and still have just an enormous passion for physics that mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. that matches what we find when we walk around you know MIT and talk with the students and the faculty. 
the the enormous um, you know consuming passion to figure stuff out was very much in evidence with these folks, even when they were otherwise struggling to get by. They didn't have comfortable or or traditional types of jobs in the field. So in some sense, their passion and and again this sort of fun and not quite taking themselves too seriously. They, there was a a moment when they just kind of cobbled this new way of doing physics together, and that did have some real appeal to me actually. Yeah. Both, both, and they're a little different. I mean, in, in when I'm a professor here at MIT and lecturing to classrooms of exquisitely talented people mm -hmm. who had a few other courses as well to kind of draw upon, it's usually not from scratch that they're learning, trying to learn these um, difficult ideas or unusual ideas. That's one way of engaging, and that's that's mm -hmm. fun has its own challenges. Um, but then, what if you get sort of one crack at someone, right? Sort of the, the right. mythical general reader who's not going to sit through three more semesters of quantum, right. even though I think it would be good for their soul. But this might be one or one of a few kind of shots, one of te uh, um, opportunities to say, "Isn't this just the most weird and wonderful thing you could ever spend, you know, some time thinking about?" Mm -hmm. uh, and that requires a kind of approach. Um, in terms of the the storytelling, embedding that in, in maybe a little kind of palatable way, mm -hmm. but also just the words, metaphors, pictures, the kind of um, pedagogy that gets, that gets written into it, so it doesn't hopefully doesn't feel like you know um, Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. right? so, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, it, partly, quite frankly, it's partly a device, and partly it's mm -hmm. um, to try to say, you know, aren't we all incredibly lucky? To be able to spend a lot of time, and you know, it's a lot of time it's spent um, trying to, you know, in a very disciplined and very sort of hard working sort of way to, to, to beat our heads against some big questions and, and hard problem sets and all the rest. Um, and again, is there a way of, of, of encouraging the, the quest with at least a little hint of a kind of humor or at mm -hmm. least of, um, mm -hmm. uh, or, or he's just taking stock. Like this problem is really hard and I'm working my tail off and I haven't slept in seven weeks or like these kind of things. But, but this is, but, but it's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. That we, that, that we get the privilege to, to, to think about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and not just one-on-one -on -one individually, but see this sort of amazing chaotic community, right? That's active today, that has its own history and has gotten here through some, Sort of series of paths and accidents mm -hmm. that it's a it's a dispersed activity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that I think is very exciting as well. Mm -hmm. You know, work really hard, and that's not hard to guess. But also, uh, it takes enormously gifted mentors along the way. And I personally can look back from high school or maybe junior high on. I mean, just. Um, I've come to appreciate only more in retrospect how amazing some of these mentors were and teachers and instilling knowledge and pushing me hard, but also just that sense of, you know, you can do it too, uh, which is at least as important as, you know, A times B is going to equal C. It's a, it's a huge passion for the topic um, of research because one is going to devote large, large chunks of one's time to, mm -hmm. to the research process, which again, I think is actually a great privilege that we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you have to really want to get out of bed each morning to do that, right? Um, so you have to love it and work hard and, you know, have great mentors and a supportive community and hope that the, you know, opportunities open up. So it's yeah, multiple levels. I, think. I mean, I do think the, the Cambridge Science Festival is just an incredibly exciting development here locally that we get to take advantage of it. Um, we here in the greater kind of Cambridge area, but it's become a model um, for science festivals uh, throughout the United States, and there's already a tradition of them in Europe, and, and they're, we're all kind of in dialogue now. Um, and the notion of bringing kind of all kinds of events of all kinds of hands-on and, and um, interact with interesting people, mm -hmm. and to make almost all those sort of free and open to the public and kid-friendly. Mm -hmm. And I just, I mean, I honestly, I get, I get very excited about that. I, I almost, I kind of get goosebumps about the idea that. Again, we, we can do this kind of on a daily basis at MIT, and I'm very really grateful for that. Yeah. But then to open up windows into that or, or entrees in to think about really, really stuff, stuff that's just cool for starters. It's just cool, right? Mm -hmm. As well as interesting and important. And, but there's a, there's a kind of fun and interest factor um, that's, that's really large. And we can bring that to kids, right, and families and, mm -hmm. and or adults who are, are, have other, you know, daily routine so they can we can have a kind of a moment at least maybe more than just a moment to to build a bridge and interact so i i'm just delighted that this, the festival is here and thriving it's been several years strong and become a model 
And so it's a real pleasure, just a, an honor to be able to participate. Mm -hmm. so. Huge thank you to Professor David Kaiser for taking time out of his schedule to talk with me. His event will take place at 3 p.m. on Sunday, April 29th at the Democracy Center in Cambridge. Hope to see you there.